Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar in the Bookcase on YouTube. Today I am joined by Andrew Ridker, author of Hope, available now from Viking. Andrew Ridker was a new-to-me author, and I saw the cover of this book floating around on Instagram, and I was instantly intrigued by it. And I'll let you Google, or if you're watching this on YouTube, see on the screen what this cover looks like. Um, But I also saw that this book was being compared to Jonathan Franzen, who's one of my favorite writers and also a friend of the podcast, which is still shocking to say. But from there, I looked into this book and it sounded like something that I absolutely love, which is a family saga full of hilarity and heart. And just to give you a quick synopsis of this book, the year is 2013 and the Greenspans are the envy of Brookline, Massachusetts, an idyllic and idealistic suburb west of Boston. Scott Greenspan is a successful physician with his own cardiology practice. His wife, Deb, is a pillar of the community who spends her free time helping resettle refugees. Their daughter, Maya, works at a distinguished New York publishing house, and their son, Gideon, is preparing to follow in his father's footsteps. They are an exceptional family from an exceptional place, living in exceptional times. But when Scott is caught falsifying blood samples at work, he sets in motion a series of scandals that threatens to shatter his family. Deb leaves him for a female power broker, Maya rekindles a hazardous affair from her youth, and Gideon drops out of college to go on a dangerous journey that will put his principles to the test. From Brookline to Berlin to the battlefields of Syria, Hope follows the Greenspans over the course of one tumultuous year as they question and compromise the values that have shaped their lives. But in the midst of their disillusionment, they'll discover their own capacity for resilience, connection, and ultimately, hope. I think the Jonathan Franz and comparisons are very apt, but I also think Andrew's doing his own sort of thing here. And I really enjoy talking with him. It's one of my favorite conversations that I've had to date in terms of Andrew feeling like a reader and writer who is very attuned to my interest. And we had a really fun chat about family novels, about traditional realism, about autofiction, and how all these things are informing him in his writing. I had a really great time hearing his perspective and learning from him, and I hope you all enjoy the episode as well. If you enjoy listening to this episode, or if you enjoy reading The Room generally, a great way of supporting the podcast is leaving a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts, or sharing the episode with family and friends is another great way of doing that. Also, Hope is published by Viking, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House, of which I am now an employee. Now let's get into the discussion with Andrew Ritko. Andrew. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I have so many questions for you about this book. I loved it so much. Um, I tend to love like family novels generally, and this one I think is definitely at its core that um, following four members of a family and the hilarity and devastation on one hand that ensues um, and kind of capturing that over the course of one year. And so for you, my first question is just how you landed on the family as a structure that you wanted to explore and hope? I would not have guessed maybe, you know, 10 years ago that I would be writing family novels. I'd always wanted to be a writer, um, but I I would really not have thought that would be a sort of genre I felt comfortable in. But this is now the second family novel I've written. And I'm, (laughs) I guess I'm kind of writing a third. So it's been a kind of weird process of realizing um, almost asking myself that very question, like why why am I drawn to this when it's not necessarily the the number one goal at the front of my mind? And I think one of the things I like about it, in addition to the freedom to explore multiple perspectives, which is also just something I like on a on a craft level, um, there's something about family where the stakes feel very high, kind of inherently, because unlike a romantic relationship or a friendship though those can be very intense relationships and obviously great books have been written about them. There's almost, there's no walking away from family. There's no divorcing your parents or your siblings. Um, And that to me has always felt like an interesting, uh, almost starting point. Like no matter how bad things might get within the members of this family, there's not really an escape hatch for any of them. Uh, So it kind of builds in this natural tension and these certain set of givens that I I like to sort of play within rather than leaving this possibility on the table like, oh, and just no one spoke to each other again and everyone moved on. It's almost like they can't do that. So what can they do within the family structure? Um, I'm from a very tight knit family and it's wonderful and it's also very stressful. And that feeling of trying to like get out, get out of the family or define yourself separately from them or how they separately from how they see you is a big uh, preoccupation of mine. So the book, as you mentioned, you know, it's like divided up into these individual sections where it is a family novel, but it's also about like a 
a, a broken family in some ways. So the chapters are sort of distinct. And I like that tension too of it's it's about a family, but they're kind of there's the pieces of their story aren't like 1000 percent integrated. There's a little bit of fracture between them. Yeah, and I, I think the fracturing works really well. Like I was I remember I was reading it and I got to Maya section and I was like, I hope we get like a Gideon section and we did. Um, so that was like really exciting to me. I didn't know where it was going, but um, yeah, I mean, I thought, I thought it was interesting how you kind of compose, I guess maybe my next question for you is about plotting because you kind of instill for each character their kind of own attempts at an escape hatch or something that kind of fractures the family relationship in a certain way. And the reader kind of is like, well, are they gonna, like, how are they gonna get through this? Like, what is their like end goal gonna be? And so, um, I wanted to ask you about each character here, but maybe before we get into each one, like, how did you think about plotting this novel out and like the structure of it? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I knew pretty early on, I think like early on in writing a book, you you make a couple decisions that for better or worse, end up sticking with the book because you need a sort of, you need some limitations to work with it. So <clears throat> a lot of those times those those decisions are about structure. And in this case, it was about, uh, for some, whatever reason, I got the idea early in my head, I want this to be structured like a relay race with, with each character sort of holding the plot baton for 80, 90 pages and then passing it to the next character. And that created both a sort of built-in chronology, but also, you know, these like challenges and limitations and opportunities to say, okay, this plot point has to happen here, but it have to, has to be from this person's perspective and how would that change depending on the order of these characters. So it's really just in some ways like an organizing principle, um, but one that sort of thematically fit uh, for me. But I would say too that, uh, I mean, I always write with a very detailed outline and I never follow the outline. And both of those things are happening like at the same time. So I'm consulting the outline every day. I'm, I'm turning to it like a security blanket but it's never goes according to plan at all. And usually the best stuff happens when I veer from the outline. So there's a, there's a sense in which I need to sort of plot it out to tell myself that there's a plan and there's a, I'm not just stabbing in the dark, but I really am just kind of stabbing in the dark. Um, so certain plot points like the father Scott's medical scandal were sort of there from the, ju from the jump, but how his kids would react or how his wife would react and, what the chain reaction would be um, was much more a process of discovery. I, I feel like if I looked up the, the original draft of the outline, it wouldn't resemble this book very much. Or you'd be like, oh, that's weird. That's like same characters, but like different story. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I seem to not be able to do without one. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, in terms of like this book and what I what I thought was so effective too is how the book opened. So um, we know it's 2013 and this opening scene is so funny uh, for many reasons, but um, my partner, he's Jewish. And so like, I kind of, he, I was telling him about the opening scene and he got like a kick out of it too. He doesn't really read. So I wish he would read this book, but um, <laughs> uh, I think he would really enjoy it. But um, I think it's really funny how you kind of lean into like that Jewish humor. And it also ends like on a note of suspense as well. Mm. So just kind of open floor, how do you land on 2013 as a start? And then this opening scene as a start? Yeah, absolutely. So 2013, it was an interesting decision because my previous novel had been written in it's set in about the same time you know 2012 2013 2014 but it was being written pretty close to those years um so there was a sense in which i was trying to like i, I got very hung up on this idea of like writing a very zeitgeisty novel that would like be about the, the moment and sort of touch on all these very particularly contemporary issues um, but then, you know, it takes two years, three years more to write a book. It takes one year, two years to get it published, maybe more. And by the time the book came out, it we were living under Trump and the entire cultural political space had changed. And this thing that had, I had intended to be very of the moment felt almost like instantly dated in that uh, the sort of violent shift from Obama to Trump gave shape to the Obama era and allowed us to see it in a way that might usually take more time to sort of be like, oh, what was the last you know decade about? But with, with such a violent shift, it, it just was thrown into con uh, contrast and became more visible. So this time around, I was like, I still wanna write about that time and I can't write about the times I'm in, which was Trump, COVID, 
you know, racial justice protests, Me Too, like so much upheaval was happening every day that I was like, I don't really feel like I have a good grasp on this moment. And I'm still interested in the Obama era, but I'm going to be able to do it now with the, with the sort of historical hindsight. And I can say, okay, I'm not writing about right now, I'm writing about 10 years ago, and I have the benefit of perspective. So what was different then? Um, but also what what was going on then that maybe I missed that could have led us here? I, I wrote a chunk of the book in, in my hometown of Brookline, Massachusetts, where the book is set under quarantine during COVID in the early months and feeling like I'm here living in my childhood home again for the first time since I left for college, but in a very different world. Um, the last time I was here, I was 17 or 18 and Obama was president and things felt optimistic and now I'm here again and you can't go outside without a mask and your people are like scrubbing their groceries and all this stuff. So a big part of it was like, okay, what, what was happening then that I missed and how can I write my way out of quarantine and into this recent, but sort of also distinctly historical moment. And I picked 2013 in particular because it felt like that moment in his, in Obama's second term where the optimism that has propelled him into office is starting to wane. So it's not like 2008 and everyone's like so excited and, and bright, but it's also not uh, 26, you know, 14, 15, 16, and, and we're staring down like this potentially disastrous election. It's, it's this kind of tipping point where, you know, the, the hope is starting to curdle a little. And that felt like it fit for this family who everything's worked so well for them up until this moment, and they're going to start collapsing uh, as well. Um, and as far as that opening scene goes, yeah, I should, I guess for context, I should explain like, there's these, th there, there are these things I wish I could take credit for making them up called hunger banquets where, you know, it's a dinner party and everyone draws a card and you're divided up into a high, middle or low income tier. And you also have a little character and you basically perform this dinner party as anything from, you know, an American uh, business person in the high income tier to a Haitian rice farmer, for example, in the low income tier. And depending on what tier you're you're in, uh, that affects how much food you eat, where you get to sit. Do you get to sit at a table? Do you have to sit on the floor and eat with your hands versus using utensils? And it, to me, is such a quintessentially Brookline, Massachusetts thing. Even though it wasn't I've invented there, there's this sense of like, I mean, we did this as kids or, or my school did it. Um, I remember that, you know, in the, they set up the cafeteria and everyone drew cards and it was meant to illustrate you know, inequality, the lottery of birth, but it's also kind of absurd. It's like, we're all just these suburban kids uh, pretending to be uh, like poor from other countries and acting as though we can't just go to the vending machines after the hunger banquet's over and like get some Doritos if we're still hungry. So I don't know, there was just something about that, that attempt to do something good in a slightly absurd comedic way that felt very, Brookline, it felt very sort of the, the corner of Judaism that I'm from of this sort of like reform, social justice minded, um, you know, Jewish thing. So it all really just felt like if I'm going to introduce, you know, a reader to these characters, let's meet them in their natural habitat, which is going to be like a petty, but well-intentioned and kind of inappropriate and kind of absurd uh, social justice dinner party. Um, it just kind of like hit every, I'd actually been trying to write it for a long time. And I had a previous abandoned project where there was a hunger banquet. I've been like trying to use the hunger banquet for, for a very long time. And I finally sort of found its place here. Yeah. And when I think about it now, it feels kind of like its own contained short story, but then it does set up mm -hmm. like the rest of it. It's really, it was really fun to read. And the woman who draws the card of the Haitian rice farmer, she brought a babka and at the end she <laughs> she wants it back <laughs> because right. she didn't get to eat it at the dinner which is funny um which i saw was a question on this card that came with the book oh, yeah. um really funny um so okay so going from there um we are introduced to scott and his drama the medical scandal of falsifying blood samples and the reasons for him doing that despite being being established in his career and so for Scott, which is my partner's name as well, which is fun. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, so where did that plot line come from? And a related question, his mom, who is like, maybe my favorite character in the book, um, <laughs> Marjorie, <laughs> like how did all that start for you in this book? Yeah, I, 
so my father, like the character Scott, is a cardiologist. Um, but so I so I sort of grew up hearing about different forms of, you know, research scammery that would take place in his, his sort of universe. And it always interested me because uh, I don't know. I mean, I just grew up around a lot of talk about like clinical trials and and, and pharmaceutical trials. And it had never occurred to me until I started hearing these stories from him that like there were all these opportunities for graft and 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 sort of cons within that structure, but that it was a kind of unusual structure. And, you know, it's not your typical like rob a convenience store thing. It's a much more white collar, upper middle class, you know, uh, version of, of of petty crime in a way. And I really liked that. And it, I, I sort of felt like, well, I could do this kind of Breaking Bad, but Brookline thing where a sort of upstanding guy starts to violate his principles and it spins out of control. But in this very specific context of like these real things that happen. I mean, just the other day, people have been sending me this headline, the head of, uh, I think the president of Stanford University just stepped down for like fudging data in past scientific tries, you know, research and studies. And so it's a pretty common thing that um, also felt like a funny way for a character who needs ca quick cash to basically invent fictional patients to enroll, send in someone else's blood samples, maybe even his own blood samples, and then claim that the patient died or dropped out of the study just after receiving the money you get for having enrolled a new patient. And uh, it was fun to actually sort of talk through with my dad, like what would be the ins and outs of that if someone was trying to do this, like how would it work? But I, but I also needed a reason why this this upper middle class physician would would be under the gun for for money. And and again, I I, I kept thinking back to like what would be the sort of Jewish suburban upper middle class version of this particular type of financial pressure. And I I sort of settled on his mother, the grandmother of the family, Marjorie having basically been conned out of her uh, savings by this like online paramour, this teen boy she's met on OkCupid, which, you know, again, I have friends whose grandmothers have gotten into this and these stories you hear about, I mean, people basically preying on sort of lonely older people um, and sort of getting money out of them through the internet. Uh, it just sort of felt like, a perfect motivation for Scott to, to violate his ethical principles because he's someone who has lived a just ethical life his whole life and been rewarded for it. And now suddenly he needs this money to send his mom to this retirement community. And that's what prompts him to sort of break the rules. But to him, to himself, he sort of justifies it as like, I'm just trying to be a good son. Um, and I think that's part of his motivation, but part of it's also the thrill of transgressing and of getting that sort of get rich quick type of money when you've been very slowly ethically climbing the ladder your whole life. I think for many of us who, you know, like to think we live ethical lives and then you see someone, you know, or some, you know, like just almost like cut a corner and get the place that you want to be so much faster. It becomes so tempting to think like, well, why I'm always doing everything right. Like surely I won't get caught for the, first and only time I'm going to cut a corner. Uh, and then, of course, that's what happens to him. But there's just a lot of ways in which I could use, you know, this very contemporary condition of old people getting scammed online and fuse it with this research scammery that I'd grown up hearing about into a very, again, sort of like uh, Jewish suburban version of a crime story basically yeah i mean that's something that's really interesting to me and that was really compelling because i haven't told you this i don't think but before so i just started working in publishing last week and before that i was a lawyer and so we had you know a lot of classes about like ethics and like hearing stories about lawyers that led, led ethical careers but then they later in their career for whatever reason transgress or violate some ethical code or uh, rule and so it's just interesting to me to kind of see Scott, who seems like this very wholesome, like, you know, very pure kind of character who makes this decision and why someone would do that. And it feels very, I guess, realistic and compelling and also funny um, with the Marjorie component going on there. And I mean, each of the characters here in the family all kind of have their own transgression. I, I'm realizing that I'm looking through my notes now, like what's going on in each of their plots. And so mm -hmm. I guess carrying from there, well, actually, before we go into Deb, I'm, cu I'm curious just to talk about Marjorie a little bit more in terms of like how you 
wanted to kind of stick to this kind of realist idea, but also kind of lend humor. Like, was humor something that was difficult for you to to craft in a novel, or does it come kind of like easily for you? Do you think? Yeah, it, I mean, it comes pretty naturally in that I, it feels a little bit like a first language to me. I definitely grew up like, you know. I mean, watching The Simpsons, SNL, like Mel Brooks and George Carlin albums, like just big, a big comedy household. My sister and I both did improv. We were writing, we're like co-writing comedy scripts right now together. There's just a lot of laughter, but specifically comedy, almost in the like the sense of the art form of comedy uh, in our house growing up. And that's something my sister and I like really share. Um, so in, if anything, it's more about making sure the humor's not trampling the higher goals of the novel um, and, and serving them instead. Because I think it, the, the, the temptation to write like just a series of punchlines that like maybe make a reader laugh, but don't get that person deeper, you know, more deeply engaged on the character or story level uh, is not appealing to me. And I've read books like that before where the first 50 pages, I'm just cracking up. And I think this is the greatest book ever written. And then after another 50 or another 50, I start to stall out and I'm like, you know, it's like, it would be like watching a three hour stand up special. You'd say like, okay, after a while you start checking your watch, you know? Um, and I think those, those two, those two impulses, the sort of veneration of comedy as a way to reach people and amuse people and also sort of speak the truth in a, in a sidelong way. My, my veneration of the novel as an art form are constantly if not in conflict, then in conversation with each other. And I'm, it's it's off, often a balancing act of like, how, how can I make this credible but funny? It's, there's a lot of scaling back of ideas or cutting back for, for, for just that reason you mentioned. That, ex, that place of realism or like hyper-realism where things are plausible but a little bit exaggerated is, is kind of where I like to live. And, you know, you can think of like a movie, a Coen Brothers movies, like something like Fargo where you're like, these characters are so real, this world is so real, but everyone's like a little bit keyed up into like a slightly absurd, you know, to, to a slightly absurd degree. That's the that's just the gray zone I like to live in. So if the, I need the characters to be believable as human beings, and then I need them to pick the most absurd out of the like five believable decisions they could make in a given moment. So that you're always kind of thinking, I don't know if that would happen or if I would have done that, but I can see how someone might have and what if they did or what if I did what kind of situation would that get me into so it's a it's a way too of just kind of like keeping things grounded while while asking these fun what ifs like what you know we all could imagine getting scammed by like a romantic partner online and we'd all like to think we wouldn't do it but you just have that one there's that small place in rainbow like what if it's the five percent chance that we it did happen to us what kind of crazy position would that put us in? And would we do something even crazier to fix that? Um, and that's just, I don't know. I, I don't know what to call it, whether, yeah, like hyper-realism or something, but keeping it real while exaggerating it with humor too is just, uh, it's like, that's the sort of aesthetic universe I want to, to create and live in basically. Well, I think you're really successful on that front. And that's, some, that's a place where I like to live as a reader as well, because mm -hmm. I think the novel is such a capacious form that I think it kind of allows to like, through, I guess, editing or just kind of figuring out those exact choices that you can make to kind of kind of keep one foot in the realism, but the other one being entertaining or like having some sense of spectacle. Because I think this book, there's a lot that goes on and it's really entertaining at the same time, even despite, you know, some really hard things that the characters go through. But that's what I think good novels are are, are doing um, or good films or what have you. But just good storytelling, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'd just add to that, like, I, there are some, there are books that I love and that I've really come to love in more recent years that are sort of realist and domestic to a to an extreme degree where like very little happens and it's all kind of in the sort of texture of the prose and and I I've come to those books and I've come to appreciate them but a little bit later in life and I think maybe part of this is growing up with uh uh the sort of legacy of hysterical realism like becoming being being uh in eighth ninth grade uh, starting to like poke around my parents' bookshelves in an age when like Zadie Smith or Jeffrey Eugenides or Jonathan Franzen were like these big names and feeling like reading white teeth and going, there are some crazy things that happen in this book. There's also some very 
realistic sort of down to earth things that are happening in this book. And then it's been interesting watching like these currents and this pendulum shift where I feel like that era was so extreme that we got sort of pushed into this other more like auto fictional, uh, like personal, if it didn't happen to me, it's probably not gonna happen to the character type of novel. And I feel like I've been sort of quietly biding my time waiting for the pendulum to swing back a little bit into a space where, you know, if it's not hysterical realism, then it's at least sort of packed with story and incident and, and absurdity uh, without leaving the real world behind, I guess. That's so interesting. This is like my favorite topic to talk about. So I love this, but like, yeah, I think a lot about, so like my, my first questioning about like the novel as a form kind of came like two years ago, I would say, um, reading like autofiction and thinking about yeah. like, what is this, like, what is this doing? Like, what is, what's going on here? Why are these kind of novels being published? And admittedly, like I started reading voraciously again after like growing up reading like horror novels and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, then really starting to think about like what this is doing. And then I have later, you know, read Jonathan Franz and after reading those autofiction novels, and he's mm -hmm. now one of my favorite writers. And I see what you're saying too, about like maybe the pendulum kind of shifting or swinging the other way. And I'm curious to see where that's going to go. But I mean, just before we get into the rest of the characters, like, what do you think about autofiction as a form? Like, do you feel compelled ever to write in that kind of style? Or do you kind of feel yourself purely in that like hyper-realist uh, aspect you're talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, I love, there's so many, works of autofiction I love and that were really, you know, I think, I think for many of us who didn't, um, maybe weren't reading like the French theory that like, you know, decades earlier is informing, like informing these works of autofiction, like reading, reading Ben Lerner, reading Rachel Cusk, reading Sheila Hetty, especially at like a formative age, you know, it sort of rewires your brain a little bit. You you go, I didn't know you could do that in a book. And that's so exciting. And every I have this experience every time I read uh, a Ben Lerner novel. And I, I mean, I think he's just one of the, the best, if not the best living writers right now. But whenever I read one of his books, I put them down and I go, well, that's it for the traditional novel. Like who can, how could you write an, a regular novel after that? Um, but then, like some hours, days, weeks go by and I find myself back to craving story or multiple points of view or whatever those, those things are that we associate more with traditional novels. I also think there's a case to be made that the reason the novel has survived where other areas like classical music or dance or even like painting have sort of hit a little bit of a dead end is that it has stayed the same. And even with modernism and postmodernism, people are still writing novels in the mode of Jane Austen or Flaubert. It, it's not like uh, you can't do that in the same way that if you just were painting people like John Singer Sargent, it wouldn't like shock the art, it wouldn't like move the art world in some way. I don't know. What I love about it is that it, like you said before, it's capacious, but it can also like weather these changes. So we can have I mean, I'll read Ben Lerner or Sheila Hetty or whoever and just love it and then and then think like, but every book can't be this because then we we'd miss out on like some of the fundamental pleasures of storytelling. And I definitely probably wanted to be a Ben Lerner or something like that when I was younger and just came to a place where I was like, that's not my strength. I like telling stories. I like multiple points of view. I like writing in the third person. And I also find myself like pretty boring. Like I, I, and I'm not saying that like auto fictional writers, I think what they do best is take, take the things we see every day that are kind of mundane and make them artful. But I don't, I don't have the capacity to self mythologize very well. I don't go about my day thinking like, whoa, that's interesting. Like what's interesting to me is something I'll hear third hand and then exaggerate 10 degrees and apply to a, a fictional character. That's what kind of gets me going. Um, and I actually, maybe this is the time to say that the, there was a previous version of Pope that was like the sort of uh, junk heap novel that this grew out of in the end. And I spent like two years writing it and then that was in the first person. And it was like a little bit like the book as it turned out, but it also had a lot of that auto fiction in it. And I was constantly getting lost in, in losing the boundary between myself and the narrator, um, which just got me into these weird situations where I'd think like, what would this character do here? Well, what would I do here? And the answer was always, I wouldn't do anything because I'm just like a normal 
passive person. And I need the, I need characters who are a little bit bigger than me to do the thing that's kind of outrageous to get the story going. Um, because otherwise it's just me having thoughts about stuff and, and not acting on anything. And I, and the novel was really kind of static because of that. Um, so I need to get outside myself just enough to be able to invent, I suppose. Yeah, I mean that, so there's a quote near the end of the book um, following Maya's perspective. And I had a question for you about this. It was, she was writing for the same reason she read, the reason she'd fallen in love with books in the first place, didn't have it lives other than her own. And I said, same for Andrew. Would you say that that's the same for you based on your answer? Yeah, I mean, I definitely understand like, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the thrill of seeing yourself in a book whether that's on a level of identity or like a deeper level of emotion, you know, just feeling like I've had this feeling and here's this character having this feeling. But for me, I've always just felt like how unfair it is that we only get to be alive one time, if if assuming you're not, you know, Buddhist or whatever, and and how like limiting that is. And I've always felt, I remember feeling as a kid, like almost the injustice of that. Like I'll only ever know what it's like to be Andrew Ridker, but I'll never, I'll never get to access anything else. And for all of the hype around, you know, VR or, or immersive gaming or whatever, nothing can make you ex actually feel like what it's like to be someone else, except, except a book, really. I mean, it like reading a novel, you take on the rhythms of these characters' thoughts and dialogue there's something happens when you're reading it in, in your sort of head voice and you really do become them a little bit. And I think there's a way in which, maybe this is just like a less corny way to say, you know, what they told us when we were kids of like, reading is like a magic carpet to any, to foreign lands or, or, or whatever, you know, or your imagination is your passport. But I really do feel like it's this incredible opportunity to like, like what would, what I've never had X experience. What would, what happens when you, when that, what do you feel like when you get divorced or have a child or lose a child or any number of things that I might not have experienced in my life? You can read a whole shelf of books where characters are going through that stuff. So I that what that line was my little bit of like my sort of <laughs> subtle dig at like, yeah, like the stuff I like is a little bit different from maybe the stuff that's popular at the at, in this moment, which feels very sort of autofictional, but it's also a little bit of a um a call to arms for for writers to uh step outside themselves if they if they should they choose to um if uh, right outside their identity should they choose to uh for readers to be on board with that uh there was you know some time you know five years ago where there felt like there was a little bit more policing going on of this question of like should you write this can you write that and while i understand the concerns in a very real way it was also that line was also my way of saying like, look, I'm reading I'm reading Anna Karenina, which has like I'm I'm identifying with Anna for this reason, Levin for this reason. Like Tolstoy is sort of like Levin, but sort of different. But he's also writing the other characters, and I've always just loved the thought of the author as this god kind of godlike figure, bringing these people into being, inhabiting them. Um, and even though I love auto fiction and first person writing in general. If I wanted, I wanted to make my little, you know, play for, hey, it's okay if you want to, and it's not just okay, it's kind of what, like, the history of fiction is, is based on. Yeah, I mean, just chiming on two things you said there, one being, like, just going to Ben Lerner again, too, I read one of his stories um, in The New Yorker last year, I don't know if you read it, it was, uh, it was the one about the guy that chokes on, like, a piece of meat. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it's, like, an existential, like, crisis basically like right. what that would feel like and thinking about his whole life um love that story but thinking about that like even i was blown away by it but you said something earlier about like that can't be the only thing you know like that kind of auto fictional style or that one type i mean i think another book that i read that really made me think about this and what you were just saying is george Eliot's middlemarch i'm not sure if you've mm -hmm. read it but like that kind of idea of the author playing god is something that i think is so interesting and even when yeah. like George Eliot kind of imposes herself like in the narration near the end of the book like I was geeking out over that and it kind of does like this sort of it's a different thing from autofiction but there's still some kind of like meta-ness to it that I think is so fun and so any like I don't know imposition of rules around novel writing kind of makes me nervous um right. on that front and yeah I don't know those are all interesting ideas but I think it's cool to see how even 
though you're writing in this mode, it sounds like auto fiction and these inquiries or like this kind of self reflection still informs the way that you write like traditional realist fiction. Um, would you agree with yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's been so, the not just auto fiction, but the discourse around auto fiction has been so unavoidable, uh, you know, for people following the book world for the last, you know, and I was in, I was working in publishing what, like 2014 to 2017 or so. So that was like a big thing then too. And it was just hard to avoid. So whether it, it's like, okay, it was going to get in there one way or another. I, I also like what you said about George Eliot's narration, because there was much more of this in my previous book and maybe none of it in this book, but I've always liked that too. When you read a, a you know, a 19th or 18th century novel where there's no narrator character, but the narrator has opinions and feelings. And it's sort of felt to be, it goes against every writing workshop dogma, which is like, okay, so what's the point of view? Who's saying this? It's almost like if you're gonna be God, be, be the silent, you know, uh, a, a, a God who has abandoned us, who like sort of leaves us to make our own judgments and decisions. Um, but there's something really fun about that snarky voice that comes in in those older novels. You can see it in everything from, I mean, it's in like, you know, Tom Jones and Vanity Fair. It's in it's in all these things like, and it, I, I'm okay with the author doing that. I don't, I'm like, yeah, it's the, the author doesn't like this character and he's gonna say so, you know? Um, but it was also just nice. Like, I, I feel sort of torn off in between like, like in the same way that there's this auto fiction, you know, re more traditional realist fiction push and pull. There's also like the sort of NYC MFA debate and pull. And I've sort of lived in both. I like worked in New York publishing and then promptly went to get my MFA and then moved back to New York. And I also find myself constantly being negotiating those two value systems and, and sort of the aesthetic rules of each um, and trying to find like a sort of happy place that I like that's in between them. Um, but both have rules and conventions that need to be navigated and thought about, I think. Yeah, I mean, that goes to something. So one of the characters, Maya, she works in publishing. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know I, know, I know, I know now that you had that experience. And I'm wondering, I mean, it's kind of an autofic, pulling from autobiography, I guess, and wondering, like, now that I have just started working in publishing, I was very compelled by that uh, plot line and seeing how she navigated that. Um, and just thinking about how, like, publishing will or will not impact the way that I read books. And how did you go about writing about like her publishing experience and that whole story. Yeah, there was a time when actually she didn't work in publishing and I, I don't even, I'm trying to remember what I had her doing, but it was like something that, it was something in the sort of vein of management consulting that tackled some of the issues of the book, like capitalism and, and class in a very like direct way. And then, and I was talking to friends who'd worked in that field or similar fields and trying to sort of get a grip on it. And then it just hit me that like, this isn't a world I know. And it's also not really a world that interests me. It, it sort of interests me intellectually, but it doesn't get me excited to write about. Um, and I sort of realized like, well, I, I was in publishing, which creates, which touches on all these themes, but in, a, in this, from a sort of slant where it's like, we're talking about money but we're talking about money as it uh, intersects with art. And I suddenly was like remembering all this stuff about my time in publishing and how, you know, you graduate college as an idealistic English major who's like, books are like not a commodity. They're like beyond commodity. They're like, a, they're, they're art, they're, they're like something special. And then you go to a place where they are a commodity and must be treated as such. and. I joke that like, I was scandalized to learn that publishing is a business, but I really kind of was. And I sort of still am a little bit. Like there's a way in which my early years in publishing, I learned a lot about the industry and how it worked, which was helpful. And then something set in where it started, I think, poisoning me a little bit where I was trying to write a novel and work in this industry and talking about books in terms of how well they sold uh, or even what the reviews were was sort of started to interfere with the, that blank creative space you need to be in. So um, it's been funny to be out of publishing now 
because there was a, a, a stretch of years where I could go into a bookstore and be like, I can tell you the back, the story behind all these books. Like this book's cover was a nightmare to get done because so-and-so worked on it. And then so -and -so, the author didn't like it. And they went back where I could say, oh, this person got that blurb because they knew so-and-so from grad school. You just get all these behind the scenes things that again, for me early on were very exciting. And then also trying to be a writer at the same time started to like conflict. And now I, I have this sort of luxury, I guess, of going into a bookstore and not knowing anything and, and getting to sort of encounter books without all that gossip and backstory, which has been nice for, for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to know, yeah, how you end up feeling about it because it's, I mean, it's, it's almost like if you have to work in an industry, you should work in publishing because you get to work with like the smartest, most interesting people that read like five books a week and it's wonderful. And at the same time, you have to make peace with yourself up front that it is an, an industry. And I just really grappled with that. So for my section, it was a lot about digging back into that experience, heightening some things about the publishing house where I worked to like a little bit of a comic a degree, but keeping it grounded again in like real things that happened or almost happened. And just, you know, I didn't want Maya to aspire to be a writer, um, at least not when you meet her. Um, I felt like, you know, the, the writer who's working in publishing as a day job, that was my story, but it's also a story that we've heard. Um, I liked the idea in some ways that she actually kind of wants to be an academic. She wants to just like study literature, um, but selling literature and studying it are very almost opposite. Like in some ways they're, they're as close as two jobs can be and as far as two jobs can be. Um, I would be actually really curious to see a conversation between like an English professor and you know a book publicist because they're, these are two people that spend all their days reading and thinking about books, but from like completely opposed angles. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you can sort of like put a, little shell around the, the 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 you know idealistic reader in you that is sort of pro propels you through publishing without like losing that i think that's probably the way to go but for me it became a, it became untenable basically yeah that's interesting i mean that, that's something i've been thinking a ton about and even like with gideon sections um or his story about you know leaving um college and he they that making that big decision how it's gonna impact his family like for me i left the practice of law and i it's a very different you know <laughs> different narratives there but like in terms of that you know making those tumultuous decisions i think that kind of dovetails there too but i mean what i try to do is like with this podcast like talking to you about auto fiction like that brings me that's like my heart like i love talking about books in this way and i'm hoping i can you know keep this going to hopefully <laughs> not have yeah. that zapped by like the capitalist force of book publishing okay. going to gideon um and i have so talking more about just a novel as a form and his love for romance novels i thought that mm. was so it was just so surprising and fun to hear i don't know to see that i wasn't expecting it um a lot of this novel and the plot progression i wasn't expecting kind of what you impose on these characters but mm. for gideon he talk about his choice of leaving college, that plot line and his like, you know, adoration for romance novels and how that informs his character. Yeah, someone pointed out to me recently, and like I hadn't realized this, but that Gideon and Maya almost model these different forms of reading or these different types of, of pleasure of like, they read for pleasure, but for different reasons. And for Maya, it's this kind of veneration of the artist, a sort of scholarly approach to like, you know, climbing Mount Tolstoy to understand it and have it enrich her life in some way. Um, whereas Gideon, he, yeah, like he loves romance novels and not just romance novels, but like very specifically the kind of like 70s, like bodice ripper paperback novels where he, like he says at one point, he's like, it doesn't matter who wrote them. It actually matters more who published them because whether it's Avon or Harlequin or whatever, these things tell me everything I need to know. And they're these kind of opposite approaches i think in my personal life i'm i'm on the maya side of like i read i probably value art and literature like too, too highly and and it's like the most important thing to me but it was fun with gideon to to explore you know sometimes it's fun to just write a character where you're like this character is going to have a different set of almost the opposite set of beliefs to me and and let me sort of explore what that would be like and in the, in his case it was yeah it was like forget the author forget the artistry 
I just want to be trans transported and, and have this escapist kind of pleasure. Um, I was not like, I didn't know much about romance novels before I started writing this book, which uh, no, no one believes me when I say, but, uh, but, but I think the sort of place where I met Gideon halfway was, even though romance novels weren't a big part of my life, the idea of being, the idea of um, romance as like a concept was big for me. Like I, I was still the same like uh, hormonal 13 year old boy as everyone else in seventh grade. But my, I remember thinking about girls at that time almost in terms of marriage more than sex in this weird way of like, like, like I was always had this eye towards like finding a partner or, or like the one at this like very, very early age because the idea of like romance separate and apart from dating or sex or hooking up always held this big appeal to me. So I, I sort of, there's a line I think where Gideon says, um, he had like his great fantasy involves the sort of binding himself to someone forever. And I could really relate to that growing up. And a romance novel seemed like a way into that. It also, you know, as I was researching them, uh, I came across this phrase that comes up in the book and called uh, uh, emotional justice. And that was coined by this romance writer, Jenny Cruzy, and it refers to like the moral law of that, that guides romance novels. And the way she describes it is like, in a romance novel, you have you you they all follow the laws of emotional justice, which is to say the they the characters will wind up together. The people in love will be rewarded with love. If you are virtuous and act right, um, you'll you'll win out in the end. And she makes this really interesting point. She goes, it's the same law that governs crime novels, where like the criminal will get caught, the detective will solve the case. There's a but in in those books, it's moral justice, and in romance, it's emotional justice. And I was really attracted to that idea because, A, it's not why I read fiction. It's actually the opposite. Like, I want to read books because they are morally gray and they don't resolve things. But I also have that piece of me that maybe is in all of us where I'm like, God, the, I wish the world worked this way. Like, it's so unfair that that bad people can succeed and good people don't. Or, you know, we don't have a justice system that, like, feels correct or 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 just. And so even though there's this big part of me that's like no like the purpose of art is to like explore these moral grays and like it shouldn't just be like the good guy gets the girl or vice versa or whatever but there is a part of me that wishes the world worked that way and i think gideon has that too and you get drawn to crime novels or romance novels at a young age maybe in part because you're like this is so much more comforting than the mess of the real world where bad people aren't always punished and good people don't always get their desserts you know yeah, one line I just remembered when you're speaking about this is when he's reading Maya's novel, a little bit of a spoiler, I guess, but he he says something, I wish I wrote it down, but he's like, this doesn't feel like a novel, but it feels like real life. And I thought that was right. a, a perfect way of how he like considers, you know, Maya's different kind of disposition towards novel reading and writing versus his. And I mean, before, so I want to round out, I don't want to forget Deb, um, but I'm wondering now, like as his mother and her own... Um, I don't know, like ambitions and goals and trying to help people as much as she can, you know, contrasted with this idea of her exploring her queerness and wanting to have an open marriage with Scott. And she's another fascinating character that I think is kind of like the heart of this book in many ways. But um, yeah, I just want to round out the full discussion with Deb. Like, how did you go about crafting her? Yeah, um, there's something that ha I think sometimes people's, uh, you know, hackles get up a little bit when they, when not just when you're writing outside of your own identity category, but particularly across categories like male to female, but also like uh, gener when you're generationally like writing someone who's a little older, I think there's a sense that there's, or there's a natural fear or concern, like, is he, does he really know what that's like? And what's that going to be like? And I certainly did research into like, you know, I read memoirs about women who, sort of discovered a new side to their sexuality around middle age. Maybe they'd been married to a man and, and sort of started exploring something later on in life because I didn't, I wasn't telling a story about someone who's like identified as queer their whole life or even really identifies as queer in midlife as much as it is like, oh, there's just this thing that I'm finding out and I don't even know what to call it, you know? Um, so 
So all this is to say, I, I did research, but what some of the research revealed was like everyone's experience of that was very different. There was not one narrative of here's what happens when you're 45 and you realize you're attracted to this woman at work and in the same way you're attracted to your husband. Like every every memoir, every study had a different story and it gave me, I feel like the license to be like, okay, I don't have to think about any of these groups as monoliths. Like this is gonna be Deb's story, not a middle-aged woman, queer woman's story, but just Deb Greenspan's story. Um, so it was really fun to write her because she in some ways is like an amalgam of the, the women I grew up around in my hometown, like my mom, the other moms at temple, the other moms at school, teachers, you know, aunts, like just all these sort of figures who I've been very lucky to have in my life, but sort of fit in a certain milieu of, of um, you know, being sort of liberal, a little crunchy, kind of do-goodery, but also you know, the respectability of the family and the home is really important. You know, I think about like, you know, the, the phrase family values is, is a big thing on the right, but I think family values are just as important to a character like Deb, even it just means something different. So if to the right family values means like heterosexual nuclear family, I think to Deb, it could mean, you know, a chosen family, a blended family, whatever. But the idea that family is the nucleus you know, and the center of life is still very big for her. It's still, that's, it's as important to her as it is for, for anyone else. So it was a fun exploration of like, who are these women that I grew up around? What makes them tick? Uh, what would happen if, yeah, they kind of like something abruptly, ha these happened in their lives that really changes them. I, I, there's a, fan a fantastic book I read called um, Don't Blame Us by Lily Geismer. And it's about it's basically an academic study of towns like mine, like the suburbs of Boston and basically why they came to be the way they are. And she talks about when feminism reaches the suburbs, um, all, a lot of women like left their husbands and, and either got, you know, partnered up with other women or just left their marriages in general. And, it just seemed to me that like the that was an interesting intersection of politics, you know, personal identity and also like social trends, like open marriages. I mean, like Bill de Blasio has an open marriage now. So it's like, it's just clearly not some vanguard thing that only, you know, blue haired polyamorous people in Brooklyn are doing. Like every, like a lot of people open their marriages. So what would it look like for like, very family value oriented type of suburban people to embark on that and how much would be to explore sexuality how much would be the just innate like i want to sleep with someone else that's not my spouse of 20 years how much would it be hey there's this like something's in the air and it's almost like permission to explore um i just really like the intersection of all that so so yeah i don't i feel like i'm talking around the question a lot but that's yeah that's deb to me yeah, no, she, she's so interesting. And it, I, th I think it's interesting how you also kind of balance that with how those decisions, I mean, going back to the family as a unit, like you're exploring her very unique situation, but it's also interesting how you're kind of like imposing that on Scott, Maya and Gideon and how they all kind of like take that information in as well. And the different assumptions, like Maya sees her mom at one point um, kissing a woman when she's younger and she has no idea why, she thinks she's cheating on Scott and she doesn't know the full <laughs> situation what's going on and how that can affect a family. Like I think going back, how you like always kind of go back to that family unit and how it always kind of works together is really interesting you know contrasting that with the the goals that you have for the character is cool yeah and like i'm about that moment where she sees her mom it's like yeah like she doesn't know that her parents have an open marriage so she thinks the mom's cheating but also she finds herself being jealous of her mom because her mom is being kissed in this passionate way and she's a high schooler that wants to be kissed in this passionate way and and it's like, and then it's like realizing there's sides to your parents that you didn't realize before, which is always jarring too. And so I sort of, one of the things about open marriage or, or, or exploring sexuality in this particular milieu was that maybe if this was set in, you know, Kentucky, it would be a case of the fact that Deb is experimenting with women is the whole that's the big deal like that's the thing we're all obsessed with and talking about in the community but because it's progressive or at least sort of self 
you know, congratulatory progressive Brookline, Massachusetts, no one has an issue or at least comes off, wants to come off that they have an issue with the fact that she's experimenting with women. It's the fact that she's sort of breaking the sacred bonds of marriage, period. But the fact that it's a woman, it's like not irrelevant, but no one wants to say that's the focus because that would be sort of copping to a prejudice that no one in this town holds or wants to be seen as holding. So there's also some fun nuance to that of like, it's not, uh, it's not about, it's not like the fact that she's exploring her feelings towards women is very relevant, but it's not the, it's not a story about that. It's, it's like, that's one factor among many. The fact that the woman she's, she's with in that scene is an artist where she herself is kind of an artist monke is like as important to their relationship and power dynamics as the fact that they're both female identifying. So I like to have it be like one data point of many. Um, and again, talk, I mean, writing across identity, wonderful. I, I'm not, it's not really my story to tell if I were to make that the central thing. Like that isn't my experience, but I can imagine it being one factor in, you know, a series of things going on in a woman's life at a given time. I have two more questions for you. And the first one being the story behind the cover. Um, I love this cover so much, um, yeah. but can you just tell the story about <laughs> how this became to be? Um, I'm always fascinated to hear that about books. Yeah, it's a crazy story. And I'll try to tell the most like streamlined version. Um, uh, I came across that photo while trying to come up with a cover image. It was very much like I'm on a mission to find stuff for the cover. And I don't remember where I came across it, but it's it's in the Whitney Museum's collection. Um, it's by this woman, uh, Melissa Penny, who's a terrific photographer. I'm sure I was Googling some combination of like words like, you know, uh, art, photography, candid family coming of it, you know, just like putting keywords in and poking around. And I saw it and I thought, this is just the most incredible photograph I've ever seen. Like it communicates so much that talk about like hyper reality, like that photo, that's the, that's the aesthetic I want to capture in my writing is this aesthetic of like, it's a candid photograph, but it's so well staged. It feels, it's so well composed. It feels staged. So it's a little bit too real to be real. The colors on the dance floor really pop. The fact that these two kids are at such awkward heights and they're staring dead at you. It's funny. It's sad. It's absurd. It like was everything to me, even though it spoke to the book in no concrete way. Like there's not a bat bar- mitzvah in the book. There's not, you can't really match those characters up to the characters in the book in like a direct way. Um, so the we contacted the photographer. She was really generous about letting us use it. But she was like, listen, we have this problem. I don't have permission slips or whatever for the two subjects in the photo whose faces are visible. And this, <laughs> this photo was taken in 1991. These kids are in their forties now. I don't know who they are or where they live or what their names are. So it set off this crazy hunt of like people posting on Facebook and Instagram and emailing friends and family being like, do you know anyone who lived in Chicago in 1991 and might've been in a bat mitzvah at the Knickerbocker Hotel? And I mean, really truly one thing led to another. And within a few days, we had the full names, professions, emails of like the kids now adults in that photo. and. It turned out that the boy in the photo now runs this massive kind of famous um, cannabis, legal cannabis empire in Chicago. And I literally, I like went to his website and I was looking at the brands, like the brands of weed he owns. And I was like, oh, I have that one. Like it was such a surreal thing. And so I wrote an essay for the foreword about the sort of circuitous path to finding the cover and what the cover, you know, means to me and to the book and to, and what it says about Jewishness. And I started getting these emails from people who were like, I was at that bat mitzvah or my, my friend's dad knows his dad and used to play basketball together. I got emailed by the woman whose bat mitzvah it was. She's not in the photo or maybe she, I think she's the girl with the back to you, you know, where it says a novel, but she's, but, and she was like, so you used my bat mitzvah photo. Let me tell you what was going on that day. And she told me a crazy story about everything going on in in her life at that time. And it was this very sweet moment of like, you know, it's rare that a cover comes out that well, but it's also just rare that like, it starts to connect all these dots. And so many people have come up to me and been like, is that your bar mitzvah? Like for a second, I thought it was mine. 
I've had non-Jewish friends be like, that looks like my cotillion dances, you know, like, I think it speaks to a sort of universality of experience. Um, and it can be read as a very Jewish image and it can be read as just like a totally universal adolescent, you know, growing up type of image. And so, I don't know, I, I also just, covers are hard. Two of my closest friends in New York are, are book cover designers, are like quite well regarded book cover designers who have done like The Idiot and The Underground Railroad and, and the, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And I, I used to sit next to them and watch them mock up covers. And so it's a process that I'm, have a weird amount of investment and interest in. Um, but I'm like so happy with how this came out and can like continue to get emails from people who recognize people in it. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's so good. I mean, I, I think a lot about book covers and it's been interesting now, like reading manuscripts and not having a cover and realizing how much a book cover like informs my read of a book. Like, I think it's so important and it's a whole separate conversation, but I just yeah. love like even how the how the title is working with the with <laughs> the picture and everything. It's just so perfect. Yeah. So I'm um, glad to have this on my shelves now. But last question for you, ask every author, like anything you're reading now, any general book recommendations from this year, kind of open floor. Totally. Um... Yeah, uh, I just started the this biography of Richard Yates, who I came to love over the last couple of years. Uh, best known for Revolutionary Road, but my personal favorite uh, book of his is The Easter Parade. I, it's it's like an entire life in like 200 pages, and it's just unbelievable. Um, I went on a big Patricia Highsmith kick uh, last year and read like not not just um the ripley novels strangers on a train or price of salt but like all i really found myself gravitating towards like what actually made up most of her bibliography which was just these like novels about unlikely criminals usually men who find themselves in some sort of weird circumstance that almost forces them or pushes them into committing a crime of some kind and then the rest of the book is you know, their attempt to clean it up or deal with their conscience as the sort of walls of guilt are closing in. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I've now recommended like a depressing author and a stressful author. Uh, but those are like the experiences I, I often, you know, sort of gravitate to when I read. Um, uh, I'll throw in a nod to um, my, my dear friend, Lee Cole, who I, I went to graduate school with, his novel Groundskeeping, which came out a few years ago, and got a ton of great, all the reception and press it deserved. But uh, if you haven't read Groundskeeping or your listeners haven't read Groundskeeping, it's one of the rare novels that did what I couldn't do, which is to say, write about Trump and the 2016 election as it was unfolding in a way that still feels fresh now. Uh, Lee is from uh, Kentucky and, and knows the area really well and writes about what we would might call Trump country in a very like sensitive and understanding way. Um, and he really summons with that time felt like without sort of succumbing to his hysteria or or it feeling like you're reading an old news article or something. So I'd throw, yeah, Richard Gates, Patricia Highsmith, Lee Cole, I'll, uh, I'll cap it at three, but um, can't go wrong with any of them. Thank you. Yeah, I, actually, I have. It's right there, I think. Groundskeeping. I haven't read it yet. Um, it's been oh, yeah, it's so well. frustrating how much time like novels take so much time to read and it's like one book that I always <laughs> want to get to and then I haven't gotten to yet so I will now that you said that um and Patricia Highsmith I haven't read her yet but last week on the pod Danny Hornsby also was talking about Patricia Highsmith so I feel like she's a writer that I need I've seen Carol the movie but like I don't know mm -hmm. much aside from like about her work or anything so I'll check she, her out she's fascinating because she was just like a terrible person in like oh. every way but wrote she you can tell she just got like some evil in her and that comes out really artfully in the books i would i would check out um strangers on a train but also um deep water the blunderer just like i could not put these books down and again it's not the detective solving the crime it's the guilty party waiting to be caught and actually i'll say as one final parting thing uh the scene in hope where scott gets caught and he's sitting into this kind of deposition directly ripped from Patricia Highsmith. I was reading all these books at the time and going, you know, Scott's gonna get caught, but like, I don't read crime fiction. I'm not like, I don't know how to write like a police interrogation scene. And then I started reading all this Highsmith and being like, oh, 
I'm gonna like take down my favorite interrogation scenes of hers. And that was completely the model for that. So um, it's fun the way that like what you're reading in a given moment can sometimes seep into what you're also writing in a given moment too. Yeah, because it seems like it's quite, you know, different genre and just style of writing, right. but it, it, it does inform that very important scene in the book. So that's interesting to hear. Um, well, thank you, Andrew, for the recommendations. You, I feel like this weird like, kinship with your brain and how you think about fiction. And <laughs> I could just listen to you talk all day. <laughs> so okay. it was just like incredible talking to you. And I thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Jamie.